Okay, so hello everyone and thanks for joining in today. Um, uh, I'm Rahul Ranjan. I'm a postdoc here in Norway. I'm part of a project called Riverine Rights and I work on intersection of emotion, climate change and rivers. Um, uh, before uh, Shalini will do her introduction and introduction to um, Dr. Dolly today, uh, I'd lay out a few uh, housekeeping rules. Um, this is a there are two ways to ask a question. Uh, one is to formulate your question, put that into the chat box, and I'll have the question read at the end of our talk. Uh, other ways to just use your emoji sign to raise your hand and I'll unmute you and you can ask your question yourself. And at any point you can formulate your question, put that into the chat box and it will be placed in the order of being questioned. So this is a series uh, that we started on early in September. It's called Crisis of Imagination, Register of Loss, Pain, Hope, and Climate Change in India. This is a series that draws upon other two series I've held last year and a year before when I started off as a postdoc. Uh, these different series have specific goal. This series, Crisis of Imagination, is... Um, is co-designed and thought through with uh, Shalini, who will speak about her work. But the idea is to develop a conversation around the relevance of uh, environmental humanities within India. And so a lot of environmental humanities, uh, you know, corpus literature that we read is often an increasingly Eurocentric. So what would it mean uh, to have a discussion on environmental humanities uh, from Global South yeah, more broadly, but India specifically. Um, and the other intention of the talk is that Shalini and I hope to do is to, as, as we progress in this series, we started on with uh, Pashang um, as the inaugural speaker, and then we have had uh, Ritodi, now we'll have uh, Dr. Dolly Kikon, and then this will be followed by Shalini Sharma, who will speak on Bhopal gas tragedy. Then we have the final talk, which is by uh, Mona Bhan and um, Radhika Govindrajan on non-human fascism. So the idea is to bring all these different um, fabric of conversation and weave them together into what we may imagine as environmental humanities um, from within. Um, uh, without taking a lot of time, I'll hand over to Shalini, who can then go on to speak. Uh, just, just for the format of the talk, um, Dr. Dolly Kikon will speak for about 20 to 25 minutes, as she said, and then we'll open the floor um, for uh, everyone to ask questions. But before that and after the talk, uh, Shalini will have a few questions, which will start the conversation. But just uh, feel free to ask any question uh, at any point. Uh, yeah. And thank you so much for joining in from different time and place at this point. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to second what Rahul just said. This is so great to see so many people here, and we're very happy that you could join us, uh, and especially Dr. Kikon. Um, you know, with all the time zones going around, we we're just very happy that you were able to uh, make time for this. Uh. Um, so, hello, everyone. Again, I'm Shalini. I work on environmental and legal conservation, uh, environmental legal anthropology, in the specific uh, context of marine conservation in the Bay of Bengal. I am particularly interested at in looking at how the coastal zone comes into being as, as a region, as an object, as this affective and uh, also very legally straight space. Um, Dr. And I'll just quickly introduce Dr. Kikon before sort of opening up the discussion. Our, uh, the talk today is relatively shorter because we really wanted to create a space for thinking and discussing together. So we are looking forward to that part as well. Uh, so Dr. Dolly Kikon, welcome. Uh, she is a senior lecturer in the Anthropology and Development Studies program at the University of Melbourne. Her legal advocacy work and research, and Dr. Kikon has a background in both law and anthropology, intriguingly enough, uh, focuses on land ownership and resource management in Northeast India including the extra constitutional regulations like the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. Her wonderful books include Living with Oil and Coal Life and, and Life and Dignity. Currently, Dr. Kikon is heading a multi-country research project uh, titled Practicing Food Sovereignty, 
indigenous peoples and agroecological relationships in the Eastern Himalayas. Her current writing projects include an ongoing book manuscript on fermenting cultures and an edited book on food sustainability and ecology in India. And since Dr. Gikhan still has somehow has more time in spite of all these projects, she has also <laughs> recently directed and uh, produced an ethnographic film titled <laughs> Seasons of Life, Foraging and Fermenting Bamboo Shoots During Ceasefire, which has been screened at several international film festivals. Dr. Kikon, welcome. The floor is yours. We're thrilled to have you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Shalini. Thank you so much, uh, Rahul. Um, I maybe will take the time right, to, to reflect on the title that I gave, you know, like feel, feeling, feeling the morom, as in like feeling the love. And uh, I, I came about maybe like thinking about extraction, you know, resource extraction, political economy in a, in, in a strange way. Um, and, and so the book that I wrote or, you know, before that, the, the doctoral thesis that I ended up submitting at the, at the Department of Anthropology at, at Stanford, I would say by, you know, was in a, in a sense quite by fluke. Um, if you not, I think the Wenerbrand abstract must be somewhere floating in 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 that like digital 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 space. But if actually you look at my Wenerbrand application, I was supposed to start off by looking at hearts, the the markets, you know, uh, which ended up becoming a chapter in my thesis and also in my book, Living with Oil and Coal. And I'm sticking to reflecting on. Uh, my first book and also you know, the, the idea of morom and why that's important. Maybe I'll, I'll read out some parts of, of the chapter, you know, for our friends who are not familiar with that and what does it mean. But, but more than that, maybe I would like to use this space uh, with our friends together here who are zooming in uh, to think about how I came to work on, on the concept of morom, which is actually a Nagamis, Nagamis word uh, for love. And that's also a language I grew up speaking in Nagaland. So besides my mother tongue, Luta, um, you know, I, I uh, spoke in Nagamese, in Assamese, in Hindi, and I could pass up understanding Nepali and also Bangla uh, along the foothills when I was doing field work. And, and I feel that language plays a really central role in shaping us, not only as thinkers, but as, as, as beings who connect uh, you know, a language in what ways. And what do we speak about? Um, in my own way, I think this more than anything, the the Morom chapter, you know, the love chapter, uh, calls me back. I think situates me not only to uh, my field site where I did my doctoral field work, but right now as I develop further as a thinker and a, as a writer, um, uh, you know, how is it? How is it that of late the the idea and the subject of love has you know, sit so centrally in the way I see the world around. Uh, there are a couple of things that are important. I, I've worked on the Northeastern region of India. I come from there and I've worked there for, I think now maybe around 25 years. So I joined the, the Naga People's Movement for Human Rights very early on, you know, almost as an undergrad student at Delhi University. And then I went to law school very early on in 1997. So I'm one of those kind of like those mature graduate students, right, who, who had an entire professional degree and then, you know, left the left litigation because I wanted to become a full time uh, activist with the civil and political rights organization. Uh, during a time, I feel, you know, during the end of the 90s, when the decades of what today is known as the secret killings in Assam and across the Northeast was also coming to an end. So things like you know, habeas corpus, cases of disappearance, custodial killings were very much as a junior lawyer, right? And were very, very much within, within, within the ambit of you know, what was happening in, civil, in the civil and political world. Um, and, and I think it was during the time when I thought that documentation was very important. So for me, I came into research thinking and connecting with documentation, right? Not by you know really thinking about oh I'm good I'm going to make this sharp theoretical contribution and go to an international conference, right? And be a star. 
<laughs> not at all. I was I was heading into I think I was heading into the the villages and into very dif difficult territories very early on in my life. You know, to police stations. Let's say you know somewhere in the Arunachal Assam border where a 19, 19 year old boy, you know, on the on on uh, being suspected to be a uh, alpha cadre, uh, is is just killed. Right. Uh, and what do the parents do? So very early on, in a way, not understanding how do you communicate with quote unquote killers? How do you actually go inside a police station when you're writing a report? During those days, we would call it fact finding. I think nowadays that terminology is disappearing. I think maybe different kinds kinds of, I think, you know, maybe positive, maybe good activist terminology is coming. But I grew up in a time, you know, and the political world became visible to me when fact finding, where you had to go and travel, right? You had to sit uh, and you had to listen to people was really integral to what the pol political world uh, meant. And, and so, for instance, I remember going to police stations and, and just police offic officials, officers, sometimes the same people who had um, maybe were, were part of custodial uh, torture, offering you tea and samosa, right? And you maintaining that composure to be able to sit and talk and what happened. And it was quite during the time when I realized that, and I reflected, but really, you know, the moments that Augusta Ball would talk about, right? Really the, the devil and at the same time, the father and the lover coming up together, almost kind of a very violent theater. And how do we understand that? That very much surfaced when I became a teacher inside classrooms, when students would come to me uh, and say, you know, my, my brother is posted in Kashmir, or my father is a colonel in the Indian army, but we are not bad people. <laughs> we are just protecting the country, right? And I had to then reflect on my role as a teacher and how is it that all kinds of conversations were actually uh, making sense and what was my role as a teacher? So I think that became very, very important. So, so coming back, maybe, you know, rewinding a lot into that phase of why documentation became such an important part for me to write and to do research was something that was disrupted in grad school because I went in really not knowing in a sense what I was getting into, you know, it was really the professional world. And then I say, I, then I thought maybe the markets, the hot bazaars made sense. So in the introduction of my book, Living with Oil and Coal, I, I opened the introduction by talking about the road trips that I was doing along, along the foothills of Assam and Nagaland. And that was the first time in 2007 when I went to check out the hot bazaars, right? They're so, they're so, amazing and is so diverse, the hot bazaars across South Asia. And I was also reading people like, I think, uh, um, you know, Stephen Goodman, where we were really looking at the Colombian highlands, you know, the indigenous markets across Latin America, and, and also uh, Bob Hefner's work, you know, on elevations, on markets, on the economy around Southeast Asia. So when I went to the markets, I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do, that's it. Uh, my my interlocutor and my and my brother, my guide, my fellow, you know, my 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 fellow kind of like uh, traveler, uh, Nilikesh Gogoi, who played such a central role in opening the foothills to me. Once I came back from my um, the exploratory field work that I did in my second year, uh, you know, while was killed, right? while was killed by the CISF, by the Central Industrial um, Forces, who were posted along the oil rigs between, you know, along the oil rigs between the borders uh, in Assam and Nagaland. And that really shook me up. I remember in grad school, you know, trying to figure out coursework, being extremely traumatized and writing petitions to Amnesty International, figuring out, you know, how did that happen? And so many things were blurry, but to cut the long story short, the, the officials got away because Surprise, it was Armed Forces Special Spar Act at play, right? So it covers both military and also paramilitary forces. The CISF, who guards our airports, also guards the tea plantations and also the oil rigs and you know also the dams in a way, and they carry guns. And across the Northeast and wherever there's upspar imposed in India, they have the right to kill to the extent, yeah, of course, 
the, the right to shoot to the extent of causing death, right? And so they got away and it really, really shook me up. And I was like, I need to figure out what happened. Uh, and the and the the threat in the case was that you know the Amnesty International report is still online if you want to have a look at it was that Nilikesh was returning from a coal mining village after sunset, right? So he was a resident of Galiki, and coal mining is a seasonal work across these artisanal areas, you know, of, of these coal mining villages. He was returning after sunset, killed. And for some reason that stayed with me, right? What does it mean to return from a coal mining village? Why is it so violent? And imagine these questions are coming to me like way after more than 10 years that you know, I've claimed to, to have done human rights and all, and how much I did not understand because the lens of uh, militarization and extraction really you know, came alive for me after the death of Nilikesh. And so my first book is dedicated to him. But it was, it was almost kind of a spirit, right? Which kind of pushed me into this world where I had no idea what I was doing. And it was kind of the second year of my PhD. And by the third year, I had to write an exam. And I was like, I'm clearly, clearly out of my debt. There was no way I was one of those smart students. You know how grad schools are, especially if, if you've been to if you've been to North America, whether it's Canada or the US, people don't shut up, right? They don't stop talking. They know so much. And I was the opposite. I remember being called out in class by my own course because I wasn't articulate and I wasn't clear enough. So it was often not the professors calling me out, right? But it would be, uh, for instance, I mean, Rahul, you wouldn't do that. But it would be like Rahul calling me out and saying, Jolly, stop it. You're not being clear. Do you mean this one or this one? And they would actually give me uh, multiple options because I was so inarticulate in the world. And that was also like literally like, you know, uh, causing me to help uh, have meltdowns, imposter, imposter syndrome. And the only thing that, that, that saved me, I think, uh, and that enabled me to carry on with this project, which actually absolutely didn't make sense. I remember one of them called this project um, esoteric, right? And I had to look it up. I was like, the, he was like, and, and he took a long time, right? Because he was trying to be kind to me. He said, such an esoteric project. And, and it was that time when, you know, I have all due respect for my, for my you know, for, for the scholars out there who do cities, but it was around that time when cities and urban studies was such a trend, right? If you do cities, that's it. You know, you, can, you, you could do London, you could do Paris, you know, uh, you could do like, <laughs> you could do one big city and you don't even have to explain it. You, all you need to say, I'm looking. I'm looking at London and people will just fawn, right? Because it's so cool. And look at me, I couldn't even place, right? The, the villages that I was gonna look at, forget about it. Also, the other disaster at that time was that James Scott came up with this one, seeing like the, of course, seeing like the state was already there, but you know, the art of not being governed, oh my God, the, the draft was already being circulated. So when I, when I went for one of the conferences in Chiang Mai, I remember, you know, I, he was talking about that and he said, I'll send you a draft. He said, the book, the book will come out after some years, but I'll send you a draft, have a look at it. So I looked at it and I was like, oh my God, how smart is this, right? The art of not being governed. But of course, his lens are so his lens are so rigid, right? It's either the hills or the valley, and people are constantly running up and down. And I was looking at a foothill where forget it, yeah. People had no idea where the northeast was. And do you do you imagine I'm looking at foothills, right? Between Assam and Nagaland, forget it. I was a lost case, right? I was a lost case, and I'm sure you know someone in the committee and all must have thought that this woman should drop out, right? Because she's so inarticulate and she's really not able to explain anything. Um, anyway. So like a mad woman, uh, you know, being called out by my own peers and all because I'm so inarticulate that they had to give me multiple choice so that I could take right what I meant. I, I go to the field. I, I go to the field and and I begin to and I begin to enter a world of stories. I begin to enter a world of stories and I kind of like really travel along. I had no idea what was happening. The most difficult thing for me doing my field work and writing the book was actually having access to uh, 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 sites of privilege, I would call it, and official sites. Because if you look at the oil world, right? If you look at the extraction world, it's really a site of privilege. Uh, the, the barracks, the barracks, the military barracks and the oil townships exist together in the same 
in the same zone of exclusivity and privilege. So, and also the tea plantations, right? The tea plantations, the barracks and the oil townships. The, the children from, from those spaces and the kind of networks and the world they inhabit is very easy for them. I was, imagine, I'm like first generation Nagaman, forget it, Ooh, which, which Assamese gentleman from, you know, the world of oil is going to talk to me. They're going to kick me out of the office, right? Um, and so, so I did not have access to anything. I really tried. I went to Jorhat, uh, you know, and one of my base was in Jorhat in Upper Assam, which is not far from the foothills. I really tried to explore that world, but they would just say like, mm, and, you know, turn away and I wouldn't get any appointments. Nothing would happen. And, and I was thinking that how am I going to make sense, right? Because I wasn't getting those interviews, those important interviews that, that was going to make me sound smart, right? I wasn't having access. Forget about going to oil townships. I had zero contact. And then I said, no, hang on. Let me just hang out with the people. And then the markets, the hut bazaars came to my rescue again. Because every weekend, I would just go to the hut. And that's where I would see the, 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 uh, the plantation workers, the experts, uh, you know, the technical experts, the engineers from the oil well come, and also the people, the security forces from the barracks come out. And where would they come? They would all come to the market spaces, right? And th so I would sit there. I had a I had a scarf around my head, and I would sit there and se sell chilies and, you know, sell all this produce with the, with the Naga traders. And, and the thing is that, you know, that's when I really began to observe what was happening. And so the kind of field work I did was really in the villages, really on the fringes, right, of the oil spills and all what was happening. When I came back uh, to grad school, uh, back post field to, to write, um, I, I began to think, where do I start? Where do I start? What is this story? Where do I start? You know, because the line was so blurry. And, and you know, as I was starting to write, uh, I learned that in every book, and you know, for those of you writing a thesis, and you know, you go for those of you who finish your first book and you're gonna write your second book, congratulations. But if you're writing your first book and if you're a writer, thinker, uh, I realized that you know, in all the writing projects we do, try to try to feel, and because this is this is a conversation we're having on feelings, right? Uh, you know, like about the heart. Uh, I think I think placing our work uh, you know, on our heart and finding which is the heart of this project, right? Where is the heartbeat? And, and I think it's like almost like mapping a, mapping a body, right? Mapping a body with love, with care, because it contains, you know, uh, stories and it contains worlds and we have to do it with a sense of responsibility. And of course, like, you know, center love and generosity. How do we do it? And in that madness, you know, when I was trying to figure out what have I collected, the first draft I wrote of my thesis was the chapter on Morong, right? And it just fell in place. And it just fell in place. It was a very difficult chapter to write. It just fell in place. And then I realized, ah, so this is the heart of my work, right? And I'm going to nurture this heart. And that's, that's how the body's going to the body's going to take shape. So, so in a sense, one of the things that really helped me was, I think, not, well, how can I say, like, yeah, not like really like smart theoretical work, but, but one of the things that helped me to write this chapter and to think about, uh, to think about that world of effect, emotion, and also a very violent uh, gendered space was uh, Senti Toy. She's a, she's a musicologist from NYU, and she's a jazz singer who lives in New York. Uh, and if you have a chance, please read her PhD thesis. I think it's one of the most beautiful thesis she wrote. And I've been begging her to publish it. And she will not even bother to look at that, right? She just, she's too cool, right? She just shrugs her shoulder and she's like, don't even forget about it. And I'm like, make me assistant, <laughs> right? This, this has to come out. And, you know, she, um, Senti Toy a jazz singer, finished a PhD in musicology from NYU, and she wrote this really beautiful, beautiful thesis on effect, right? And she was like directly looking at effect conceptually, unlike, unlike my work where I was looking at political economy and militarization. And she came up with this concept which really moved me was, you know, how do we think, right? We think that speech language 
are very important, but she was looking at Naga music, right? Looking at Naga music and looking at how is it that we constitute a world around, right? Materially, emotionally, effectively. And then she talks about breathing, right? She talks about breathing and the fact that, you know, as Naga people, we have a lot of chanting. We have a lot of chanting and, and, a, and our rhythms are different. And she connects it because she does extensive, amazing field work. She connects it to our bodily practice of June cultivation of slash and burn. The way you walk up and down a mountain really affects the way you breathe and you live. And it impacts the way, you know, poetry or thinking or philosophy comes out. And, and of course, you know, she's very much keyed into the entire liberation song, uh, you know, that entire resistance song in the US as well. And, and definitely they really connected me. And she also opens, she opened up the world of really the plantation economy, even in the Southern part of the United States of the colonies and thinking about, you know, the breeding, the theory and all. So, and that's the reason why I quote her in my, in my work. Um, and it really moved me what she said. And it, this is from a song, the language I cry. And she says that, you know, I know how to walk the walk. I know how to talk the talk. But when it comes to anguish, the language I cry in gives me away, right? And, and so I was listening to this song and then I began to write a chapter and Lulu came in. And Lulu is one of the first stories. I think I give three stories in this uh, chapter on difficult loves. And Lulu is the first story kind of like that really, really made sense to me. And exactly she spoke to me in Nagamis. And the fact that, you know, she was so much erased from my own field notes because I had gone to collect quote unquote, an important interview, right? From a household, from a coal mining uh, household in, in Sonari. And, and she was really on the fringes. And she came back after I was, I, after I was done with the interview and I went back to my uh, host's place where they were hosting me, she came back in the afternoon to meet me. And that was really a period of unlearning for me as well. You know, what is research? How do we listen? What do we do? And I think I still have a lot more to learn about how to, how to be compassionate in doing field work. You know, what are the voices that we're listening to? Um, and, and so in, in a sense, I think it really, really moved me. If, if we can just like very quickly go through, through the concept of Morom, the fact that it was also in Nagamis was, as I think, a, a, a space of liberation for me. It's a, it's a language I grew up speaking. It's a language I continue to bond with my other tribal communities, Naga communities. When I go to the foothills, you know, I speak that language. When I'm in Dimapur, I speak that language. There are jokes that I can create. And, and being multilingual and Thank God, English is not my first language, right? It makes me so much richer, right? So when I'm able to connect with, of course, there's this entire language politics in India, right? About Hindi or about, you know, Bangla or something else. But imagine if we can look at language as a place of connection, right? As a place of love, it completely changes. So the way I, I will speak in Hindi to, let, let's say, a military personnel who is checking me and frisking me at a, at a border, and the way I would speak uh, with, with, let's say, someone like Uma, Uma Chakrabarty, who's one of my mentors in Delhi, would be so different, right? It would be like night and day. So I think as researchers, how do we place, how do we place language became so important for me. And so in a sense, thinking about Morum opened up this world and I think really, really made me travel. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm talking so much, but, you know, very quickly in my own current work, maybe I'll just talk two minutes about food and I'll stop there. Rahul, am I doing okay with time? Am I talking too much? No, you Just, have you have 20 minutes, Dolly, actually left to speak. I have 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. So 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 in my so in my in my own, perhaps that in my own um uh, you know the, the, the current work on food and all, one thing that's really come up, and I'm quite shameless, okay. I, mean, I you know. Anthropology as such has all these categories, right? Linguistic anthropology, social cultural anthropology, all this. And I jump, I jump like crazy, right? How do you know about filmmaking? Imagine shameless me, I went ahead and made a documentary. Oh God, I want to hide. But, but that was really fun, making the documentary as well. Uh, I had some money, it was my sabbatical. I had some money, I had to make it. So the two videographers, I had one, uh, one the, both are from Dimapur, they are, they are local videographers. One is a wedding videographer. The other one is a funeral videographer. And, and I gave them the money. I was like, let's go, you know, make a documentary on food. And they thought I was mad, okay? And, and we went 
And the wedding videographer, you know, the way he would move the camera would, even if it was just bamboo shoot or, you know, like fermented stuff and it stings and I've written about food that, you know, who wants to eat stinky food in India, you know? And the way he would bend the camera, you know, and I would sit and look at him, you know, and be totally fascinated. <laughs> and, and the funeral videographer, because, you know, in Naga society, I, funerals are a big thing. Right? You need a videographer. Of course, the person is dead, you know, bless his or her or their soul, and they wouldn't get out, but you need to choreograph it, right? So, the, so, so there's also a funeral videographer, and his, his, the location of his, of his camera was so interesting for me because it would just be static. No, it would like, it's as though you're just capturing, you know, some kind of sloganering. And, and I was fascinated, you know, the way the camera was moving. So with a wedding videographer, a funeral videographer, and I was there, right? The cartoon character with no idea about filming. And I insisted then I'll sit at the editing table. And the, it was this wonderful editor in, in, in the city of Guwahati. He teaches in a local college and he said, he'll give me, he'll give me time. And, and so I, I would go and we would, we would edit together. And he didn't understand Lothar. So the, 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 the documentary Seasons of Life actually is, is in my mother tongue, Lota. And so I had this amazing time. Uh, and I learned so much about mediums, about language, about what to do and all like with, with, with my teachers, with the two videographers and the editor, uh, Hirok, Hirok uh, from Gohati. And I would love to continue to work with them. But in a sense, making the documentary and the documentary is important in the story and food because that, after making the documentary, it helped me write the grant, right? So the Swedish research grant is quite hefty uh, and, and it's very well endowed. It's a three-year grant. So if you are looking at grants and what you want to do, do something else, right? Do something creative, something crazy. And you know, someone's going to actually, the universe is going to help you to put together a team. But, but make sure, okay? Make sure you hold on to the joy. You know, we, we, we know about academy, we know about the darkness, you know, the, the, the suffering that's there. And that's why that's even more reason that you need to hold on to the joy, okay? Okay, that's really, really important. So after I made that documentary, I went ahead and then I wrote that, right? Wrote that uh, proposal, you know, with my team and figured it out what to do and all. And <laughs> we applied for two grants, two grants. We, we kind of like, you know, the, the same huge conceptual uh, framing and we got both. <laughs> And I was like, can we have both? Apparently there's a law in Scandinavia in Sweden. You can't get two national projects. You need to choose. And the whole like shaking his head. It's like this greedy woman. Hang on, that money was not from me so that I could get, yeah, I could hire local postdocs, right? Back in India, we have to, I mean, the, the state of research is, and also money and resources, we all know, right? We're all like, our hearts are there. Uh, it's, it's challenging, so I was like, how do we get like you know that into 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 that part of of the project so so after we got it it really it was a it was a 10 minute nerdy documentary i know for all of you like experts listening to me you know have these amazing skills from amazing schools will be laughing at what i made but it was just creating a space of joy right creating a space of joy and bringing together community bringing together a team to tell the story so when i went ahead and i I, I kind of like did a deep dive into this food sovereignty, you know, agroecology uh, conversation. One of the things that have come up, this is the second year, this is close to the second year of the project and next year is the final year. Oh my God, it's amazing. Um, it's just, it's just like come to me and come to the entire team that, you know, how do we, we talk about methodology, we talk about contribution, but imagine, having these kind of grants where community engagement is centered, right? Where, where the idea of writing, you know, and authorship is turned on his head. Yeah? And, and, and so like, what does, what does transcribing mean? So for instance, we have a book that's coming out. <laughs> I'm so excited. So Zubani is bringing out the book on food, which is also part of the, you know, part of the uh, project. Um, and, and this is the first edited book I did. So others, I've just co-authored, or I've single authored, and I learned so much as an editor. First, how to practice generosity. Secondly, to be extremely respectful, right? And you know, the people who were most vulnerable in the list of contributors were not researchers. We're actually freelance, right? We're freelance artists. And then I realized how much they're pushed around. 
right? Often they are not paid, they are pushed around, the photographs are just taken, and the stories I heard, right? Some of the photographs have been on book covers of university presses, and they've been paid zero. I'm sorry, right? And it opened up an entire world. Some of them were quite kind of like, uh, right? Uh, abrasive in, in their communication between the beginnings, like, what do you want? Da, da, da. And you know when it's, and I realized it came from a place of hurt and being used and abused. Right? If as researchers, imagine we have institutional backings and yet we feel so pushed around sometimes, can you imagine the state of freelancers and artists, especially photographers and all in, in the global south in a country like India, and especially if you're Adivasi indigenous or Dalit? Right? We talk about the political, politics of citation and ref referencing. What do we do about other mediums of, of, of maybe non-textual uh, concepts and, and ideas and philosophies? How do we center it? And so this is the project that really made me unlearn once again and dwell on these themes, right? And I think it's, it's helping us connect with the issue of love and lo loss. And very rightly, as Rahul and Shalini brings up this, the politics of hope and why it's so important. And, and so this, this is a book that's very close to my heart because one of the contributors nearly dropped out. She disappeared. She was like, forget it. I, I don't have the time, right, to write it. 3,500 word. I don't have the time. And you know why she didn't have the time? She didn't have the time because she is a full-time activist. Her she doesn't even have time to eat. But who cares about 3,500, right? It's not gonna help her anyway in her career. And the reason that she couldn't write, she told me, and she was so happy actually to be invited, but she was like, Dolly, I can't do this. Why? Because, you know, she was, spending a lot of time at the police station during the pandemic, okay? Like two year lockdown, there's still the conception there's a book on food, right? Uh, with Zuban, it should come out uh, maybe like January or February. Like, so so they make sure you all get a copy and we'll talk about it again. And if we meet, like we'll cook together <laughs> and we'll discuss the book. Um, so she nearly dropped out because in the middle of the pandemic, do you remember the sexual violence graphs really went up, domestic violence graphs really went up. And look at us as researchers, right? We are like, ah, oh, like the deadlines and all, what nonsense, yeah? And she was spending all her time at a police station because two minor Adivasi girls in Assam uh, who were uh, being, I think, employed as domestic workers were raped and killed, sisters. And she was like, you know, I have no time. And I was like, my God, what am I doing? And so my co-editor and I decided that the idea and the, and the process of collaboration and co-authorship needs to change when we're working with activists, right? Even if she can give us an interview, that's her voice, that she's the author of that, right? How do we do it? And so in a sense, I'm so grateful that essay is now part of the process and thanks to her and thanks to her patience, right? Thanks to her, Sangita Tete, that she, she, she welcomed us in her life and she gave us a story. So actually, it's not our generosity as editors. It's her generosity, right, that, that she gave us the time to tell that story. And without her, I told my co-editor that, you know, there's no way we're going to go ahead with the, with the book without her. So it was an interview that was transcribed, that was put. We sent her a draft. We said, this is your work, right? What do you think of this? That was a major, major learning process for me. And that opened up a space actually for, for me as a researcher to think about different ways of engaging, right? Um, you know, if, imagine the, the world of gaming, right? Uh, you know, the, the world of like puzzles, you know, what opens up? And, and I have a friend, V Gita, who's the co-founder of, of, I think, uh, Tara Books in, in Chennai. They do, I think, some of the most political books, right? And how do they do it? Why is the creative space a political space? Thanks to these mentors and these teachers, they really taught me that. Uh, the last point that I'm at the moment thinking about is the connection, once again, because we started more on, you know, the, the Nagami's work on language, is the connection between language and ecology. So I'm trying to write, okay. So this is, so this is a crazy collaboration with, with an undergrad student from <laughs> Agriculture University, um, you know, and then, and then, uh, uh, a, a researcher, a freelance researcher, who is, who is the coordinator, Joel Rodriguez, of, of this project. And I'm there, and three of us, we've been, we, we have been trying to write this, this, this essay. I don't know who will take it. I think maybe no one, no one will take it, but, but it's okay. Like, you know, we'll just self-publish as well. 
on, on plants and edible plants. And when I went on a journey in my mother tongue in Lota, figuring out the, the meaning of the plants, I realized this, this journey of loss, right? With this journey of loss, because I was looking for, so I started from Dimapur, I went to Kohima, I went to Woka, I went to Longsa, I went to Koyo. I kept going back and back and back up into the mountains and down in the valley, trying to figure out what was the Lotha name of the edible plants. It was so difficult to find. Guess why? Because as we lose forests, we 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 think that language, uh, you know, vanishing or extinction. And I would like to quote my friend Mabel Gurjan, the amazing geographer, who says, you know, the, the the idea of vanishing and extinction doesn't happen out of context, right? There's a huge history of long history of dispossession and colonialism at play, and also violence that at play, right, in the context of the lectures. And you know, even in the context of the Naga people, I realized that. Man, the, the decades of militarization, you know, and the self-censoring of conversations, one of the things that really kind of impacted was language because, because it really did not allow us to communicate. And I never thought that I would embark on edible plants and language, uh, language, you know, loss of language. And of course, the, the, the connections between ecology, language, right, and politics really came up as a triangle. So with the loss of forest and militarization also means that we lose language. So how do we kind of like make sense of that? So at the moment, it's really in the world, in, in my head, it's really in the, in the realm of rambling and putting it together. But, but I think right now in my, at, the, at this stage in my life, you know, the idea of collaboration is really, really fun. And I'm most grateful when I was a postdoc, my mentor and now my uh, colleague, uh, Ben Carlson, made sure that our postdoc uh, project, you know, Living the Land, which became the book Living the Land, uh, was written and he mentored me how to do it, you know, in, in terms of a concept. He's somebody who was working on indigeneity for a long time in South Asia. And one of the gifts he gave me was that he made me the first author of the book, right? And so that was, that was a huge gift and also a responsibility I took on myself. So today as a mentor, you know, as a collaborator, I make sure that the first authorship actually goes to my postdocs or, or in a sense, right? It's given to community. And how do we make sense of that? So I think, I think this, this current project is once again, you know, teaching me and, 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 and helping me, I think, to learn about the world uh, around me, uh, nurturing love and hope. So I'll stop here and then I'll maybe I'll listen to you. <laughs>